Welcome to Baalbek, ancient Heliopolis. In this application, we visit the city as it appeared around the year 215 of our era, which can be considered the peak of its ancient development. A bird's eye view gives us our first look at Baalbek and its hinterland. We are hovering above the fertile Becca Valley that stretches over 120 kilometers between the two mountain ranges of Lebanon and anti-Lebanon. Below, we see the town of Baalbek, a place that has been inhabited for over 10,000 years. In Roman times, it was called Heliopolis, the city of the sun. While Baalbek today has almost 100,000 inhabitants, it was much smaller in Roman antiquity. The most famous landmark of ancient Heliopolis was the great sanctuary of Jupiter, who here was called appropriately enough Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus, that is to say, Heliopolitan Jupiter, the best and the greatest. The complex belongs to a series of Roman constructions whose remains are sprinkled throughout the city. Baalbek lies on the edge of the Becca Valley, at the point where it reaches its greatest height and where its watershed lies. Nearby are the sources of two rivers, the Litani, which was called Leontes in antiquity and flows south, and the Orontes, which grows to considerable size farther north in Syria. The Becca Valley has always been very fertile, and the two rivers are responsible for this fertility. The name Baalbek actually means Lord of the Source. Water, as a guarantee of fertility, was therefore closely linked with the city and certainly a reason for the sanctuary's construction here. This impressive complex alone put Heliopolis on the map. Without it, Baalbek would probably have been and remained a small, insignificant village. But the sanctuary was more than the center of Heliopolis. Over 300 meters long, it is one of the most imposing complexes of ancient architecture, not only in the Middle East, but in the entire Roman Empire. The Sanctuary of Jupiter, of whose enormous temple six columns still remain standing, is surrounded by other structures. These include the so-called Temple of Bacchus, one of the best-preserved temples in the ancient world, a much smaller circular temple, and near it, a small temple rectangular in plan. We will visit all these sacred places on this tour. Besides these and other temples, we know of column streets, a thermal bath, a theater, a large banquet building, and much, much more. We know much less about the residential buildings of the Roman town. We are looking at the sanctuary from the west. This means that we see it from the rear, looking not only in the direction of the rising sun, but also in the direction of one of the springs that are so important for Baalbek. Sun and water equal fertility, and that is what the cult of Jupiter from Heliopolis was basically about. Look at this temple. Fifty-four columns, each almost twenty meters tall, support the temple's roof, ten each at the front and at the back, and nineteen along each of the long sides. From here, its most recognizable feature is the famous so-called Trilithon, gigantic stones quarried locally to construct the temple podium. You can find out more about the Trilithon at stop 36 on the tour. The building material of choice here was the limestone extracted from the quarries in the area. Not until Roman times were these quarries exploited on a large scale. Probably the stone material was delivered from this direction, stored temporarily and prepared for backfilling. Perhaps the workshops of the blacksmith or other suppliers were also here. To the right of the large Temple of Jupiter stands the small temple, the so-called Temple of Bacchus. Don't be deceived when we call it small. It is bigger than many other Roman temples elsewhere. Only in Baalbek could it be considered the small temple. It is not certain to which god it was dedicated. Some indications speak for Bacchus, whom the Romans also called Liber Pater. The most that can be said for sure is that it is at least a hundred years younger than its great neighbor, the Temple of Jupiter. We will take a closer look at both temples at other stops on this tour. To begin your tour, please click on the map icon on the upper right-hand part of your virtual tablet. This will open a map. 
you are free to click on any blue circle on the map and you will be teleported to see the feature you have selected. Let us land now in front of the sanctuary so that we can explore it. Welcome to Baalbek, or rather to Heliopolis, as the city was called in Greek and Roman times. With its sanctuary of Jupiter, this city hosted one of the most magnificent temples in the entire Roman Empire. We have entered the city and now have arrived in its heart. Here, in the center of Heliopolis, we stand in front of the great sanctuary of Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus. This means Heliopolitan Jupiter, the best and the greatest. The title is an allusion to the god who presided atop the Capitoline Hill in the heart of the imperial capital at Rome. There he was called simply Jupiter, the best and the greatest. Let us have a look at the reconstruction, which shows the site around the year 215 of our era. The plaza, paved with stone slabs, is surrounded on the city side by a semicircular wall as it opens on the entrance to the sanctuary, the mighty elevated hall of the Propylaea. We are familiar with such structures from other ancient places such as Jurassa in modern-day Jordan and its temple of Artemis with the court in front. These half-open places served as spaces for gatherings and as places to sit to watch a spectacle. And so here, too, there are deep steps hugging the semicircular wall where people could sit and watch what happened on the plaza. They looked up to the sanctuary as if from the seats of a theater whose entrance hall towered in front of them like a large stage set. In the middle of the plaza stood several big structures, of which we can see only a few traces today. Some of the features once included tower-like altars, statues on high pedestals, and fountains and other water installations. Important streets once crossed through the semicircular forecourt of the Jupiter Sanctuary. Here we can imagine a daily bustling spectacle, again like on a stage with the great sanctuary as the backdrop. Even before we have actually entered the sanctuary, the first questions arise. Who stopped here and what were they doing? Did any cult rites take place out here? Is this where worshippers prepared to enter the sanctuary itself? Researchers of antiquity have boundless curiosity. We discover, observe, pose questions. We try to explain and ask ourselves more and more questions as we zero in and try to discover new things. With every new insight and discovery, new questions arise, and at the end of the day, we sketch our own image of times past with, we hope, ever greater precision. Let's go in. We are now standing in front of the Propylaea, the entrance to the holy precinct of the Sanctuary of Jupiter. The term Propylaea comes from Greek and usually denotes monumental gateways and sanctuaries. These Propylaea here are huge buildings in their own right, larger than many ancient temples. In Baalbek, this is just the entrance, though. The monumental open staircase takes the visitor almost seven meters above ground level. The staircase is divided into three sections and framed by wide stringers. At the top is a portico with twelve high columns. It opens to the east, while the back is closed off by a wall. The column shafts are made of rose granite, brought more than 1,000 kilometers from the Aswan quarries in Egypt's far south. Each column shaft consists of a single piece of granite. The bases, and also the Corinthian capitals, are made of the native limestone. 
If you have a look at the reconstruction, you can see that some of the capitals were gilded. This was done in honor of Emperor Caracalla, who was said to have visited Heliopolis in the year 215 of our era. We know that two men, presumably in the emperor's inner circle, commissioned the gilding. They immortalized themselves with inscriptions still preserved today on pedestals under the columns. The portico is framed by a tower at each end. Their exteriors are decorated with projecting pilasters that resemble the columns and seem to continue the column portico. Coins minted in Heliopolis in the third century of our era depicting the propylaea let us easily imagine what is lost today. In order to understand what happened here, let's return to today's view. In the medieval period, crusaders for a time ruled the Lebanese coast. To protect against this threat, the sanctuary of Jupiter was converted into a castle during that era, and its spatial organization was reversed. The propylaea, the original entrance, became the back and was probably turned into a prison. The grand staircase was demolished, the colonnade was bricked up, and the decorative elements inside were struck off. The castle entrance was at the opposite end of the complex. When archaeologists started working here over a century ago, they opened the ancient entrance again, and it was made accessible by a smaller staircase on which we enter the sanctuary today. As we now go up and enter the sanctuary, we step out of the profane environment and into a sacred space dedicated to the gods. We are now standing in the colonnade. The ancient visitor arrived here by mounting the entrance staircase, which you can visit at stop two on this tour. A glance back gives us a look at the semicircular forecourt and the people standing around, sitting down or just crossing it on the way to the sanctuary or to the city. But now let us turn our back on this scene because we are about to enter one of the most magnificent sanctuaries of Roman antiquity. A long space lies perpendicular to our path, illuminated by the light falling between the columns. Before us we see a large portal with a huge central door over ten meters high as well as two smaller side doors with moldings. The wall in which this portal is located was decorated with two rows of idiculi, one above the other. The Latin word idicula translates loosely as small temple. Archaeologists use it as a technical term for a niche in a wall decorated with a trim made of flanking columns topped by a pediment. We encounter the term again and again on our tour. 
When the sanctuary was converted into a castle in the 11th or early 12th century, the monumental open staircase was demolished, and both the spaces between the columns and the large main portal were bricked up to create a completely enclosed space. If we assume that prisoners were locked up here, we can imagine that all the adiculas were also trimmed off to keep them from climbing the walls and escaping. Originally, the Propylaea portico was the entryway. Unfortunately, we do not know whether people in antiquity only passed through or whether they stopped here to participate in rituals. The possibility of such rituals is suggested by the fact that there are separate rooms at both ends of the portico. Originally, they were freely accessible, but were closed off at some point in late antiquity. We are now standing in the colonnade. The ancient visitor arrived here by mountain. Light falling between the columns. Before us we see a large portal with a huge central door over ten meters high as well as two smaller side doors with moldings. The wall in which this portal is located was decorated with two rows of idiculi, one above the other. The Latin word idicula translates loosely as small temple. Archaeologists use it as a technical term for a niche in a wall decorated with a trim made of flanking columns topped by a pediment. We encounter the term again and again on our tour. When the sanctuary was converted into a castle in the 11th or early 12th century, the monumental open staircase was demolished and both the spaces between the columns and the large main portal were bricked up to create a completely enclosed space. If we assume that prisoners were locked up here, we can imagine that all the adiculas were also trimmed off to keep them from climbing the walls and escaping. Originally, the Propylaea portico was the entryway. Unfortunately, we do not know whether people in antiquity only passed through or whether they stopped here to participate in rituals. The possibility of such rituals is suggested by the fact that there are separate rooms at both ends of the portico. Originally, they were freely accessible, but were closed off at some point in late antiquity. as small temple. Archaeologists use it as a technical term for a niche in a wall decorated with a trim made of flanking columns topped by a pediment. We encounter the term again and again on our tour. When the sanctuary was converted into a castle in the 11th or early 12th century, the monumental open staircase was demolished and both the spaces between the columns and the large main portal were bricked up to create a completely enclosed space. If we assume that prisoners were locked up here, 
we can imagine that all the adiculas were also trimmed off to keep them from climbing the walls and escaping. Originally, the Propylaea portico was the entryway. Unfortunately, we do not know whether people in antiquity only passed through or whether they stopped here to participate in rituals. The possibility of such rituals is suggested by the fact that there are separate rooms at both ends of the portico. Originally, they were freely accessible, but were closed off at some point in late antiquity. We are standing in the Propylaea's north exedra, in a space separated by two pillars from the column portico, but originally freely accessible. The room has a counterpart on the other side, meaning that there may have been a pair of guard houses to the left and right of the entrance. That said, it is not necessarily the case that humans stood guard here. Judging from other sanctuaries, it is quite possible that statues of two deities protected the entrance here. The walls of these rooms were supposed to be decorated with two rows of small niches in which would have stood a variety of figures. This type of wall decoration can be found throughout the sanctuary. However, the rooms in the Propylaea were never completed. The walls are frozen in a state of construction, and the small columns of the wall niches were never set up. For some reason, the builders gave up on completing them, and later, but still in antiquity, they were closed. The passages between the columns were bricked up in such a way that they could no longer be entered. Only windows were left through which it was possible to look into the rooms. We are now standing between the Propylaea and the altar court. It is one of the sanctuary's most idiosyncratic buildings because of its hexagonal plan, a rarity in ancient structures. 
The open court, about 30 meters in diameter, is enclosed by a colonnade with granite columns. Behind them are rooms. The hexagonal shape can only be seen from the interior, and only if you look closely. The walls on the east and west line up with the sanctuary's axes, as well as the east colonnade of the great altar court, creating spaces for large portals. The walls on the north and south sides, however, are oblique. They are the only ones not aligned with the sanctuary's strict rectilinear organization. Let us consider the spatial qualities to get a sense of the hexagonal court's function. On the one hand, it is a passageway, that is, the path to get from the propylaea to the altar court and back. On the other hand, it is a central plan building with its own strongly accentuated center. Such spaces were often used for meetings. Here the four rooms behind the column portico open onto the middle of the court. All four are oriented to the court's midpoint. Someone standing on that spot could direct events in the court centrally or give a speech. The hexagon is probably an attempt to translate these two requirements, passageway and gathering space, into architectural form. The court also offers some special features. A three-part gate led to the propylaea and another to the altar court. With these gateways, the hexagonal court was the only built part of the sanctuary that could be completely closed off, making it a space focused inward. This design feature also interrupted the comings and goings through the sanctuary. Thus, at least temporarily, what was happening in the entire sanctuary could be subordinated to what went on in this space. By the way, we know from studying the building phases of the sanctuary that the hexagonal court was only inserted as an afterthought between the altar court and the propylaea. Today, the space has lost most of its original decorative elements owing to a number of changes from late ancient times onwards. When, towards the end of the 4th century of our era, the Christian religion replaced the pagan cults, it served as a Christian meeting space. In the Middle Ages, the area became a fortress, and in two of the exedras we still see remains of the defensive works and these are merely the changes that were made during the centuries immediately after the pagan cults faded away. We lose sight much too easily of how long these periods last. Even the Roman sanctuary was not planned during the first century and then promptly finished. In fact, like so many of the great cathedrals of medieval Europe, Building the sanctuary at Baalbek took several centuries and was the work of many generations. Time and again there were new requirements, new ideas, and new goals. Sometimes different fashions changed the project. Sometimes new world views did. What does it mean if the entire cult practice in a sanctuary was subordinated to what happened in a meeting space? requirements, passageway and getter court. With these gates inward, this design feature also interrupted as well as the east colonnade of the great altar court, creating spaces for large portals. The walls on the north and south sides, however, are oblique. They are the only ones not aligned with the sanctuary's strict rectilinear organization. Let us consider the spatial qualities to get a sense of the hexagonal court's function. On the one hand, it is a passageway, that is, the path to get from the propylaea to the altar court and back. On the other hand, it is a central plan building 
with its own strongly accentuated center. Such spaces were often used for meetings. Here the four rooms behind the column portico open onto the middle of the court. All four are oriented to the court's midpoint. Someone standing on that spot could direct events in the court centrally or give a speech. The hexagon is probably an attempt to translate these two requirements, passageway and gathering space, into architectural form. The court also offers some special features. A three-part gate led to the propylaea and another to the altar court. With these gateways, the hexagonal court was the only built part of the sanctuary that could be completely closed off, making it a space focused inward. This design feature also interrupted the comings and goings through the sanctuary. Thus, at least temporarily, what was happening in the entire sanctuary could be subordinated to what went on in this space. By the way, we know from studying the building phases of the sanctuary that the hexagonal court was only inserted as an afterthought between the altar court and the propylaea. comings and goings through the sanctuary. Thus, at least temporarily, what was happening in the entire sanctuary could be subordinated to what went on in this space. By the way, we know from studying the building phases of the sanctuary that the hexagonal court was only inserted as an afterthought between the altar court and the propylaea. of changes from late ancient times onwards, when, towards the end of the fourth century of our era, the Christian religion replaced the pagan cults, it served as a Christian meeting space. In the Middle Ages, the area became a fortress, and in two of the exedras we still see remains of the defensive works, and these are merely the changes that were made during the centuries immediately after the pagan cults faded away. We lose sight much too easily of how long these periods last. Even the Roman sanctuary was not planned during the first century and then promptly finished. In fact, like so many of the great cathedrals of medieval Europe, building the sanctuary at Baalbek took several centuries and was the work of many generations. Time and again there were new requirements, new ideas, and new goals. Sometimes different fashions changed the project. Sometimes new world views did. What does it mean if the entire cult practice in a sanctuary was subordinated to what happened in a meeting space?
When, towards the end of the fourth century of our era, the Christian religion replaced the pagan cults, it served as a Christian meeting space. In the Middle Ages, the area became a fortress, and in two of the exedras we still see remains of the defensive works. And these are merely the changes that were made during the centuries immediately after the pagan cults faded away. We lose sight much too easily of how long these periods last. Even the Roman sanctuary was not planned during the first century and then promptly finished. In fact, like so many of the great cathedrals of medieval Europe, building the sanctuary at Baalbek took several centuries and was the work of many generations. Time and again there were new requirements, new ideas, and new goals. Sometimes different fashions changed the project. Sometimes new world views did. What does it mean if the entire cult practice in a sanctuary was subordinated to what happened in a meeting space? We are situated in the altar court. It forms the core of the sanctuary and at over 120 by 120 meters is also the largest section of the entire complex. This is certainly where the most important activities took place, the area where sacrifices and prayers were offered and people congregated. There is also an oracle here. We talk about it at stop 38 of our tour. The altar court is a large plaza. It was paved with limestone slabs whose bright color must have intensely reflected the sun's rays. The plaza was enclosed by colonnades, which were very impressive in their dimensions and materials. The shafts of the columns were made of dark red or gray granite, creating a color contrast with the plaza's light-colored paving. The columns were topped by richly elaborated Corinthian capitals and an equally richly decorated entablature, which, with its play of light and shadow, must have looked like a wreath crowning the court that caught the eye and then steered it toward the temple.
We are situated in the altar court. It forms the core of the sanctuary and at over 120 by 120 meters is also the largest section of the entire complex. This is certainly where the most important activities took place the area where sacrifices and prayers were offered, and people congregated. There was also an oracle here. We talk about it at stop 38 of our tour. We are situated in the altar court. It forms the core of the sanctuary and at over 120 by 120 meters is also the largest section of the entire complex. This is certainly where the most important activities took place, the area where sacrifices and prayers were offered and people congregated. There was also an oracle here. We talk about it at stop 38 of our tour. We are situated in the altar court. It forms The altar court is a large plaza. It was paved with limestone slabs whose bright color must have intensely reflected the sun's rays. The plaza was enclosed by colonnades, which were very impressive in their dimensions and materials. The shafts of the columns were made of dark red or gray granite creating a color contrast with the plaza's light-colored paving. The columns were topped by richly elaborated Corinthian capitals and an equally richly decorated entablature, which, with its play of light and shadow, must have looked like a wreath crowning the court that caught the eye and then steered it toward the temple.
We are standing in the altar court's east colonnade, situated next to the door through which we entered from the hexagonal court. Today it is in ruins and open to the sky, but as you can see, in antiquity the colonnade was roofed over. The basic architectural form was known from ancient Greece and was also very popular in Roman times. These are elongated rooms covered and closed on one side and open on the other side with columns. These spaces not only offered protection from bad weather, but would also have accommodated various other uses, serving, for example, as a meeting place, commercial space, political forum, court or schoolroom. In what kinds of activities can you imagine the inhabitants of ancient Heliopolis engaging here? Let's look at the long space in more detail. At the colonnade's ends, where two other colonnades connect in the north and south, were small rooms. These were not freely accessible, but only had a window opening onto the colonnade. Perhaps they contained special statues, or certain gods which worshippers could not approach too closely might have been kept in them. Here, right in front of us, is another interesting space. Set into the colonnade's back wall is a domed semicircular niche. No, you could not enter it, because a statue stood in it. And what a statue! It was far larger than life. Unfortunately, no trace of it survives, so we do not know whom it depicted. What we can say is that, because of its colossal size, there is no comparison between it and the statues positioned in the idiculi of the walls. So the statues set up here must have had particular importance. A matching niche is set into the same wall on the large portal's opposite side. The two niches and their statues thus frame the entrance from the altar court to the hexagonal court on the left and right. The court was only added to the sanctuary in later planning, and these two large statuary niches were an original feature of it. In fact, scratched into stone in the sanctuary, we have a sketch of the hexagonal court design with the two niches. The statues and the reason for setting them up must have been integral to the addition of the hexagonal court and its mysterious function. But whose likenesses stood in these niches? More gods, or perhaps portraits of two emperors? As we admire the temple before us, we notice a large stone block with an inscription. Looking at it closely, we read in large letters in the top row, I-O-M-H, the acronym for Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus. Here, the god of the sanctuary is succinctly called the greatest and the best Jupiter from Heliopolis. The first three elements of the name make up the name of the supreme god of the state cult at Rome, who was venerated on the Capitoline Hill. But the fourth term indicates that this was not simply Roman Jupiter Optimus Maximus transposed here. Instead, Heliopolis had a specific religious tradition, which greatly influenced the god who was worshipped here. We have a great number of small bronze copies of the now lost cult statue that stood inside the temple. On your virtual tablet, you can find a picture of a statuette of the god which is on display in the Louvre. Of course, this statuette is only a reduction of the actual cult statue, which, like so many other things, has disappeared. So although the original is lost, we have a pretty good idea of how the cult image was sculpted. It depicted a beardless young man, which is a common way to represent the sun god Sol in ancient Rome. In contrast, the Roman Jupiter was a bearded father figure. The Baalbek Jupiter wore a long robe adorned with star symbols wrapped around the god like a tubular sheath. This is not how the Roman Jupiter is normally shown. Just as atypical are the ears of grain that the god held in his hand, alluding to his importance for fertility. We can therefore assume that the cult of Baalbek's Jupiter was also special. Even the question of what was usually sacrificed to the god has no clear answer. In theory, you can offer god anything as a sacrificial offering. Bread, wine, milk, animals, incense, flowers, and even chants. 
However, specific sacrifices were required for special occasions. Usually only select animals were sacrificed to the supreme god, such as bulls, the most powerful and valuable of farm animals. But was this also the case in Heliopolis? By what route would the animals have been brought into the altar court? Where were they led up the stairs? sheath. This is not how the Roman Jupiter is normally shown. Just as atypical are the ears of grain that the god held in his hand, alluding to his importance for fertility. We can therefore assume that the cult of Baalbek's Jupiter was also special. Even the question of what was usually sacrificed to the god has no clear answer. In theory you can offer god anything as a sacrificial offering bread, wine, milk, animals, incense, flowers, and even chants. However, specific sacrifices were required for special occasions. Usually only select animals were sacrificed to the supreme god, such as bulls, the most powerful and valuable of farm animals. But was this also the case in Heliopolis? By what route would the animals have been brought into the altar court? Where were they led up the stairs? We are standing on the steps of the North Colonnade with a wonderful view of the altar court. Today only two of this colonnade's corners have been restored, but its columns once stretched to our left and across from us. What archaeologists found here were fragments of different grades of granite. First, there was Egyptian rose granite, which still dominates our image of the sanctuary to this day, and also a gray granite which may have come from Egypt as well. But how were the colors arranged? The reconstruction you see here distributes the rose and gray granite columns in a certain way. Without meaningful findings on the distribution of the column colors, however, this must remain purely speculative. Were one half the columns gray and the other rose? Did the colors change from one to the next? Were certain areas highlighted by a series of gray columns, or were passages or individual rooms emphasized? On the court we see two colossal altar towers. They are unusual for a classical Roman sanctuary, and likely reflect a local Eastern-influenced tradition. This is not surprising since the cult in this sanctuary was, at its core, in all probability, an eastern one. Two water basins on either side of the altar underline the importance of water in a place bearing the Aramaic name Baalbek, or Lord of the Source. In this courtyard must have stood many votives, or gifts consecrated to the god, statues of men and women, soldiers, high officers, priests and emperors, all placed on tall pedestals with inscriptions telling of their donors' lives. The altar court was dominated by the mighty Temple of Jupiter, the crowning glory of the complex. Standing in the altar court, you would face the soaring temple facade. Raised on a monumental open staircase over seven meters high, the temple had ten twenty-meter-high columns across the facade. Taken together, the altar court and temple facade, in effect, formed a unit like an auditorium, with a stage at one end. Sometimes, standing alone in this court today, the only sound you hear is the whistling of the wind. We can still imagine how, eighteen hundred years ago, 
This place was once alive with movement, voices, sounds, colors, and scents. We are now standing in the middle of the altar court, as it is seen today. Before us, we view two of the most important installations, and at this stop on the tour, we will take a closer look at them. We are in a sanctuary, a place dedicated to a god, and we are naturally very curious to learn exactly what went on here. At stop 37 on this tour, you can learn why the god Jupiter Optimus Maximus Heliopolitanus is not the typical Roman Jupiter, but the local one with some special traits of his own. Looking around the reconstructed scene, we notice special elements in this sanctuary, such as a large altar tower, a structure unlike any other found elsewhere in the Greek or Roman world, but which has its roots in the regional context of the Middle East. Unfortunately, apart from details about the oracle housed here, we have no historical sources describing how ritual activities took place in Heliopolis. Inside this building, however, we find two large elaborate stairways. They would have made it possible to conduct large groups of people up one side of the tower and down again on the other. Is that enough evidence for assuming the so-called Great Altar played a role in the religious processions? Maybe the tower is more of a viewing platform on which participants in the cult could gaze into the temple from high up while simultaneously looking down at the smaller altar nearby. Next, our eyes alight on one of the ritual water basins, specifically the northern one that faces its twin in the south. Why are there such basins? Water and fertility played, and still play, a very important role in almost all religions, not only in Eastern ones. It is certainly no coincidence that, given the fact that two large rivers have their sources in the city's hinterland, water would bubble into two large basins in a sanctuary located in this city. As we have noted elsewhere on this tour, the city's name Baalbek means Lord of the Source in Aramaic. So, since water is the key ingredient of all forms of life, animal and vegetal, Jupiter Optimus Maximus of Heliopolis is nothing less than the local god of fertility. Whoever built or continued to build the temple, whoever nurtured the cult, helped to guarantee fertility. Whoever ruled over the city and the sanctuary was thus at least implicitly also the Lord of the Source.
stairways, they would have made it possible to conduct large groups of people up one side of the tower and down again on the other. Is that enough evidence for assuming the so-called great altar played a role in the religious processions? Maybe the tower is more of a viewing platform on which participants in the cult could gaze into the temple from high up while simultaneously looking down at the smaller altar nearby. Next, our eyes alight on one of the ritual water basins, specifically the northern one that faces its twin in the south. Why are there such basins? Water and fertility played, and still play, a very important role in almost all religions, not only in Eastern ones. It is certainly no coincidence that, given the fact that two large rivers have their sources in the city's hinterland, water would bubble into two large basins in a sanctuary located in this city. As we have noted elsewhere on this tour, the city's name Baalbek means Lord of the Source in Aramaic. So, since water is the key ingredient of all forms of life, animal and vegetal, Jupiter Optimus Maximus of Heliopolis is nothing less than the local god of fertility. Whoever built or continued to build the temple, whoever nurtured the cult, helped to guarantee fertility. Whoever ruled over the city and the sanctuary was thus at least implicitly also the lord of the source. We are situated in the long colonnade on the altar court's north side and see how it looks today. Where now there is nothing between us and the blue sky, 1800 years ago stretched a roof. Before us, in the sun's glare, lies the great altar court, three steps down from where we are standing. We see the ruins of the two large altar towers in the middle of the court. In front of them is a large water basin. The basin's walls are decorated with rich reliefs depicting figures of animals, mythical creatures, or garlands. A gutter runs around the bottom of the basin. A very similar basin is located on the opposite side. Both basins were fed by running water. Wait a minute. We have to climb a seven-meter high staircase to enter the sanctuary. Since when does water flow uphill? There must have been a long gravity-fed channel that brought the water out here, a considerable technical achievement. Furthermore, this arrangement only works if the line at the far end started on the same or on a higher level. There still exists, in fact, an old water channel for delivering water from the mountains over a distance of some kilometers. Its starting point could still be seen in the early 20th century. It was located on the sanctuary's axis in the mountains opposite. From there, it would have carried the water downslope through the city into the sanctuary. From the effort that would have been involved in this engineering feat, we can gauge the importance that water held for the Heliopolis sanctuary. Let us look around at the reconstruction of the colonnade in which we are standing. The roof is over 7.5 meters high. In back of the colonnade, behind another set of columns, we see various open spaces called exedras. They can be semicircular or rectangular in plan. A total of 48 columns stood in this north colonnade. The exedras were richly decorated. Idiculas on the walls would have held numerous statues. Of course, not all were intended to be filled when the structure was finished. Some would have been, but others were doubtless left vacant, awaiting the portraits of future local and imperial notables. At any rate, no statue survives, so we have had to leave the Adiculas empty in the reconstruction. We take a closer look at one of the exedras at stop 11 on our tour. 
In this long-covered ambulatory, people could stroll, meet and talk, argue, do business, arrange marriages, or have political or philosophical discussions. Such colonnades and their exedras also could accommodate other activities such as court proceedings and school classes. These kinds of activities probably occurred here in Heliopolis. We are situated. Situated in the long colonnade on the Minerva is the Roman equivalent of Greek Athena. She is the goddess of the arts, crafts, wisdom, and warfare. She is shown wearing a military helmet and holding a spear. Jupiter is the Roman equivalent of Greek Zeus. He is a mature male with a full head of hair and a beard. His symbol is the staff and the eagle, who represents his dominion over the air. Juno is the Roman equivalent of Greek Hera. She is the wife of Jupiter and hence wears a crown as the queen of the gods. Her attribute is the scepter, indicative of her royal authority. We are standing in a reconstruction of one of the exedras in the north colonnade. It is a semi-open space separated from the long ambulatory by two columns. Incidentally, of the 130 granite columns in the altar court, these two are the only ones still standing today. This particular exedra has a semicircular footprint. 
As in the rectilinear exedras, we find here a two-tiered wall structure. However, this lower tier contains semicircular niches instead of idiculas. They end with a semi-dome at the top, often in the shape of a shell. The Latin word for shell, conca, is the source of our English word conch. Just as in the case of the idiculas, we can imagine statues standing under these conches. Inset between them are long pilasters decorated with Corinthian capitals that figuratively support the entablature of the exedras. In this way, the space acquires a heightened rhythm, which not only sets it apart from the angular exedras, but perhaps also emphasizes a special meaning. Here in the altar court, these half-round exedras are four in number. Two each are paired across the court north and south and alternate with rectilinear exedras. They were part of a planning change and required the building of new foundation walls in the basements. Here, too, as is often the case, we have no written traditions to shed light on the function of the exedras. From the altar court, they are barely visible behind the colonnades. We know of pairs of semicircular exedras arranged behind opposing colonnades from other places, like the Forum of Augustus and Trajan's Forum in Rome. Furthermore, we also find the dimensions of the square altar court, 400 Roman feet, about 120 meters, duplicated in those two imperial forums. Even if we still cannot directly grasp all the functions of the rounded exedras, they may make reference to major imperial projects in the capital of Rome. At a minimum, they prove that information about architectural designs was exchanged between the center of the empire and the capital and its periphery 2,200 kilometers away at a place like Baalbek. We have made our way now to the farthest northwest corner of the altar court, where we are looking at the condition today. It would be interesting to know what would have drawn anyone all the way back to this spot in antiquity. The German excavators of Baalbek at the beginning of the 20th century called what you see in front of you the beautiful door. There are only four doors in the enormous area of the altar court, which led to a series of smaller spaces. Three of these doors were not preserved, so we cannot say whether all the doors were so richly decorated, or whether the beautiful door was as unique then as it appears to us today. Let's take a closer look at the door frame. The rich architectural decoration can only be found in the upper area. At the corners, the carvers had started to extend the decoration farther down, but this work abruptly stopped. Similar imperfections are found in many places in the sanctuary. What indeed does finished mean in relation to such a large sanctuary? This building complex no doubt was often declared finished. In fact, we have fragments of the temple's dedicatory inscription proving this. Nevertheless, construction continued with many fits and starts, and some things were simply left half done. On the other hand, new plans were made and structures were built with a different design. We can identify new design ideas, occasional new influences, or even just new contemporary taste. By making many such observations and comparisons, we can work out a chronology of the construction phases. Where does this door lead to? What would we see if we could open the beautiful door, if it were not blocked as today by corrugated metal? We would see a small unadorned room, on its left wall is another door, but oddly enough, anyone walking through it would have fallen straight down seven meters. Was there once a staircase here, perhaps made of wood? Or is this another sign of the incompletion of this part of the sanctuary? So the fascinating thing about this door is not so much its extraordinary ornamentation, but the questions that it opens up. We are now in the open space of the altar court, 
especially in the summer when the sun beats down on our heads, the white limestone pavers reflect the glare. Heliopolis really is the city of the sun. In this sun-drenched complex, you can feel it on your skin. If we look north, we see before us the small altar, and like the great altar, it is a tower that could be entered. Who was allowed to climb up its internal staircase, and for what purpose, and on what occasions? Were sacrifices or prayers offered up here? Certainly its design, too, comes more from local Eastern traditions than from mainstream precedents of Greek and Roman temple architecture. A high tower that can be entered is not commonly found in a classical Roman sanctuary. Like its larger counterpart, the small altar also provided a good view of activities in the sanctuary and perhaps also a look through the front door into the cella of the Temple of Jupiter. Does that mean both the small and the large altars attest the development of the same idea? Like so much else in the sanctuary, the small altar was modified at least once. Let's turn to our right. Our gaze passes over the great altar and over the east colonnade. In front of the south hall, which always casts shadows, lies the second basin. This one, too, has a small spring house in the middle, from which water bubbled, and a channel surrounding it for the runoff. The wall around it has smaller niches than does the northern basin, and here, too, we find wonderful reliefs with heads, sea creatures, and other, in part, mythological figures. Let's keep turning so we can see the main attraction. As we do, the enormous facade of the Temple of Jupiter comes into view. It is a gigantic mass of stone. The monumental open-air staircase, the ten limestone columns of the temple's facade at the top, and the high pediment together tower nearly thirty meters into the air. Ancient coins show us that a statue of the sun god driving his quadriga across the sky once stood on the pediment's apex. Let's look at some details. The columns have a diameter of more than 2.2 meters. The Corinthian capitals are up to 2.2 meters tall, and each column is more than 20 meters high. The front of the temple had ten of these colossal columns. We know of only a handful of ten-column temples in the entire Roman Empire. The architrave, or the stone beam, that lies atop the column capitals had an inscription made of gilded bronze letters. It is lost to us, and only a few fragments of the architrave with some dowel holes remain, so we are not certain what it said, but surely it praised the god to whom this temple was dedicated. And typically, the inscription would also name the emperor under whose rule the temple was consecrated. Interestingly, however, in antiquity, some of the dowel holes were filled in, which makes us think that the inscription had been changed after a short time. We can only guess what may have happened here. Was an emperor who had fallen into disgrace after his assassination erased from the inscription and from historical memory, as we know happened with emperors such as Nero and Domitian? This is a question we can only pose, not answer.
Here we are standing in front of a semicircular exedra in the south hall of the altar court. The building decoration has some special features that make it one of the most interesting spaces in the sanctuary. And of course we wonder what did the ancient visitors do here? Once inside, again we see two rows of idiculas. Those on the lower tier are crowned by conches, as in the other exedras. They once sheltered statues, of which, unfortunately, not a single one has survived. You will find detailed images of the conches on your virtual tablet. As you can see, the conches are framed by small pilasters that are highly decorated with tendrils, perennial plants, blossoms, and fantastic images growing upward. The base of the conches is decorated with small reliefs, some of which depict small hunting scenes, others depict sea creatures or cupids bearing garlands. However, the most eye-catching ornamentation of all are the half-domes, we gaze on alternately rib forms designed to look like seashells and ones on which an aegis is draped. An aegis is a scaled goat skin with which the father of the god Zeus, in Roman terms Jupiter, the lord of the sanctuary, makes it thunder. In the center of the aegis is the head of the Gorgon Medusa, that snake-haired monster whose mere sight turned people into stone. Usually in ancient art, the Medusa head is presented as a protective symbol for warding off bad luck. Let's take a closer look at the right conch. You will find another detailed photo on your virtual tablet. Up above, we see the Aegis with the head of Medusa. Her face is badly damaged, so we can't see the mouth, nose, and eyes, but the wild curls and the snakes knotted around her neck are still wonderfully preserved. Uniquely, here is Cupid, that winged god of love, son and messenger of Venus, but his wings are only visible if one stands directly beneath it. Cupid gathers an aegis upwards so that the fur is pushed together and the Medusa's head is tilted to the side. This depiction is unique in the entire Roman Empire. Was it a case of the sculptor once again giving himself free rein in his work? Why are three of the five conches in this exedra adorned with an aegis? Do we have a reference here to a local story, or to someone who commissioned a special decoration for this space? The question of motivation consistently tantalizes us in these situations.
Here we are standing in front of a semicircular exedra in the south hall of the altar court. The building decoration has some special features that make it one of the most interesting spaces in the sanctuary. And of course we wonder, what did the ancient visitors do here? Once inside, again we see two rows of idiculas. Those on the lower tier are crowned by conches, as in the other exedras. They once sheltered statues, of which, unfortunately, not a single one has survived. You will find detailed images of the conches on your virtual tablet. As you can see, the conches are framed by small pilasters that are highly decorated with tendrils, perennial plants, blossoms, and fantastic images growing upward. The base of the conches is decorated with small reliefs, some of which depict small hunting scenes, others depict sea creatures or cupids bearing garlands. However, the most eye-catching ornamentation of all are the half-domes, we gaze on alternately rib forms designed to look like seashells and ones on which an aegis is draped. An aegis is a scaled goat skin with which the father of the god Zeus, in Roman terms Jupiter, the lord of the sanctuary, makes it thunder. In the center of the aegis is the head of the gorgon Medusa, that snake-haired monster whose mere sight turned people into stone. Usually in ancient art, the Medusa head is presented as a protective symbol for warding off bad luck. Let's take a closer look at the right conch. You will find another detailed photo on your virtual tablet. Up above, we see the Aegis with the head of Medusa. Her face is badly damaged, so we can't see the mouth, nose, and eyes, but the wild curls and the snakes knotted around her neck are still wonderfully preserved. Uniquely, here is Cupid, that winged god of love, son and messenger of Venus, but his wings are only visible if one stands directly beneath it. Cupid gathers an aegis upwards so that the fur is pushed together and the Medusa's head is tilted to the side. This depiction is unique in the entire Roman Empire. Was it a case of the sculptor once again giving himself free rein in his work? Why are three of the five conches in this exedra adorned with an eat?